Good morning, and welcome on this Sunday when we celebrate the Ascension, also known as the seventh Sunday of Easter, because Ascension Day is always on a Thursday, 40 days after Easter. I invite you to stand as you are able and to turn to hymn number 450, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things, mercifully give us faith to perceive that according to his promise, he abides with his church on earth, even to the end of the ages. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from the book of Acts, the first chapter. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, Suddenly, two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. Clap your hands, shout to God in gladness. The Lord we must fear, King of all the earth. God goes up to shouts of joy, sounds the trumpet's blast. Sing praise to our God, praise unto our King. God is king of all the earth, sing with all your skill to the king of all nations, God enthroned on high. The second reading is from the book of Ephesians, the first chapter. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints and for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the, Lord, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put his power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. 
The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that you may know you the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We just heard the opening part of an intimate prayer Jesus is having within the trinity of his being before his death. It's as if we are a fly on the wall listening in. And we discover that Jesus is praying for us, for his disciples. He knows his hour is at hand, his death is near. But while he knows his physical presence with his disciples is ending, he also knows that the relationship he has with them and that they have with him will transcend this human life. And this is eternal life, Jesus said, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom God sent. So what does it mean to know God, to know Jesus Christ? My first call as an ordained pastor was in a community where our youth would occasionally be asked by their peers at school, do you know the Lord? It threw our teens for a loop because the next question was usually, when were you saved? with the expectation that they name a specific date and time when they declared that they knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. For most of our teens, they were baptized as infants and never knew that they weren't saved. And even with a three-year confirmation program, something most families aren't able to commit to these days, they would be more likely to say they were baptized children of God or disciples of Jesus than to say they knew God or knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. To their ears, to know God sounded presumptuous, a flattening of the awe and mystery of God. So what did Jesus mean when he prayed for his disciples to know God, God the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom God sent? 
Certainly to know in the sense of cognitive understanding or even something one can empirically prove is not what this means. No human can understand God or even empirically prove God's existence. That effort would always be in conflict with the transcendence of God and would risk reducing God to the limits of our human minds, losing sight of the awe and mystery to which the scriptures point us. Nonetheless, from the beginning of existence, we humans have sought to know God. When God told Moses to rescue the people from their bondage in Egypt, Moses knew that in that polytheistic world, they would ask who this God was and whose name he had come. In Hebrew culture, to know a name was to have insight into a person's true character. So Moses asked God, what shall I say to the people when they ask for the name of the one who has sent me? God's response was a rather cryptic, I am who I am. That doesn't tell us a lot, but maybe that's the point. It stops us from reducing God to our own limited imagination and ideas and holds within it the complexity of who God is. The very minute we think we know God, like the way we know our GPS or how we follow a recipe, chances are that God will surprise us. If we expect God in fire and earthquakes, chances are God will be in the still, small voice. If we wait in silent meditation to hear God, chances are God will be shouting protests in the street. If we expect to experience God in our religious leaders, chances are God will appear to us in the love of a small child. If we become disillusioned with the church, the community of God's people, chances are we are missing the moving of the Spirit even amidst human frailty and shortcomings. The minute we believe we have a handle on God, we are in danger of indulging in the idolatry of our own ideas and biases. We've seen that many times throughout history, sometimes leading to chillingly tragic consequences. Just last week, a gruesome discovery was made in Kenya, a part of the world where Christianity is expanding by record numbers. 179 bodies were exhumed from a property that was touted as an evangelical Christian sanctuary. Hundreds more people are still missing. Others were found wandering the property, emaciated. This was because of their pastor, Paul Nathenji McKenzie. A former taxi driver turned televangelist. Things had begun innocently enough. In 2002, he began preaching at a local Baptist church. So powerful was his preaching, and so well regarded was he, that a benefactor supported him in forming his own church, Good News International. Gradually, though, his preaching became increasingly apocalyptic, and accusations surfaced regarding the pocketing of tithes. His response was to accuse his detractors of witchcraft. He continued to attract followers and built a huge concrete church and a school for the children. He told worshipers not to visit doctors and claimed to have divine healing powers. By now, his fiery sermons are being broadcast on a gospel channel across Africa. And he had become wealthy. The sister of one who was found starving in the wilderness said she and her brother had been entranced by Mr. McKenzie's television broadcasts. You get addicted to what he says, she said, recalling how she used to rush home from work at a Mombasa sewing factory so that she could join her brother to watch. McKenzie continued to ramp up his message of the coming Battle of Armageddon. In 2019, he stunned his followers by announcing that he was closing the church selling its property, and retreating to an 800-acre property in the wilderness. He invited followers to join him, and many did, purchasing plots that Mr. McKenzie didn't legally own. The pandemic only increased the appeal of Mr. McKenzie's land offer. 
Mr. McKenzie, casting himself as a Christ-like figure, lived in a section he called Galilee. Then this year he announced that he heard the voice of Christ telling me that the work I gave you to preach end-time messages for nine years has come to an end. Mackenzie issued instructions for a systematic plan of starvation through which they would be led to meet Jesus. The plan was for Mr. Mackenzie to help lead all his followers to meet Jesus, and then he would join them before the imminent end of the world. That didn't happen. Mr. Mackenzie is now facing a court trial. Even now, there are those who defend Mackenzie. A fellow televangelist said, he is a good man, but the devil used him. Something went wrong. Whether it was the devil, greed, the lure of power, delusion, some or all of those, the fact is that hundreds, thousands of people followed him some to their death, because they believed the fiery authority and certainty with which he spoke. Somewhere along the way, Mackenzie crossed the line from being a follower of Jesus and a witness to God's love to indulging in the idolatry of his own grandeur, his own power, his own divination and biases. And his followers instead of being followers of Jesus, became followers of Mackenzie. Maybe that's why we find Jesus in this intimate prayer before his death and departure from this earth, praying for us. He knew how easily led astray we can be as humans. He wanted his disciples then and for all time to stay grounded in the one true God and in Jesus whom God had sent to this earth. This is the God in whom he wanted us to be one. In Hebrew, the use of the verb to know involves relationship. It involves intentionality and intimacy. And in Jesus, we see that it also involves humility and servanthood toward God and others. As we'll hear next week, to know God is also to be open with reverent awe to the moving of the Holy Spirit in and around us. That kind of knowing encourages questions rather than dictatorial certainty. Questions that open us to a wider and deeper appreciation of what it means to know God. Questions like, in seeking God always as light, are we missing God as darkness? In looking for God in that which is great, are we overlooking God in the seemingly unremarkable places of our own lives? Envisioning God, are we only attuned to our own colors, shapes, styles, and ways of life, and thereby blinded to God's presence in others with different colors, forms, and ways of being? In resisting risk and change, are we missing God's push for us to grow into the wonder of some yet-to-be-revealed possibility? In running from death, in trying to hold on to life, are we missing the presence and power of God in aging, in letting go, in dying itself, in trusting the journey we are on with God? in perceiving God always in that which is sacred, holy, otherworldly, or religious? Are we failing to see God in the secular when we are at work or at play, in our homes and in our classrooms, within our day-to-day -day relationships? In seeking God only in the Bible, are we missing God in that which happens around us? To know God is to embrace the questions, to explore with humility and a healthy dose of awe whether the Spirit of God is challenging us to experience something new or to encounter God in a new way. The rich and varied threads of Scripture reveal a God who will not be confined to our human expectations of who God ought to be. 
when we are tempted to believe that our way is God's way and hence the only way, we would do well to ask a few questions. The grave divisions within the body of Christ today, so often supposedly based upon what we know of God, make a humble questioning attitude particularly important. It's inherently necessary to any healthy, growing, multifaceted relationship. Christ's prayer was that we would know God and that we would be one in that relationship. In so doing, and knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ whom God sent, we share in eternal life. Today, I'm meeting with our children to talk about communion and why we come together around this table. As we share in this sacrament, we are participating in knowing God and Christ in a most intimate and holy way, and doing so in communion with Christians around the world in every time and place, a foretaste of that eternal feast that will never end. At the table of the Lord, we gather as one body of Christ, united with our brothers and sisters through receiving the bread and wine, the body broken and blood outpoured of Jesus, the real presence of our Savior with us, who graces us with the gifts of forgiveness and strength in our journeys as disciples of Jesus Christ. As we come before the altar, we are told through these earthly elements of bread and wine, who God is and what God has done for us through Jesus. We are reminded that we are loved and forgiven and nourished to leave this place to go into the world as God's people, to do what is the essence of God's very being, to love, to reach out in relationship to one another and to creation itself with humility and a deep sense of awe. This is to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom God sent. Amen.
Thank you for that music meditation, Manny. I invite you to stand as you are able and to take out your books of common prayer and to turn to page 358. Page 358, as together we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our prayers this morning are form four, found, uh, actually, you don't even need to look in your, your Books of Common Prayer. It, the response is, uh, hear our prayer after Lord in your mercy. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. In the Anglican Cycle of Prayer, we pray for the Church of the Province of the West Indies, and in the Dawson Cycle of Prayer, we pray for our military chaplains, the Reverend Corey Thornton and spouse Sarah. We also pray for Camp Mokalea and the Reverend Daryl Whitaker and, and his staff. Lord, in your mercy. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. This morning we pray for the repose of the soul of Rita Fox, mother of a friend of Sue Jennings, and Joanne Chin, whose memorial service is today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share the peace of the Lord. You may be seated for the announcements. If you are visiting with us, welcome. Please sign one of the welcome cards in the pew pocket and put that in, your, in the offering bowl so that we can uh, give you a welcome. Um, let's see. And if you'd like us to be on our mailing list, be sure to put down your email address. Today and next Sunday, as I mentioned, I will be giving in communion instruction for the children um, age 4 to 4th grade. 
Um, so if you are watching from home and you want to send your kids, or if you would like me to send a packet to you at home, let me know. Next Sunday is Pentecost. So how did, you know, the Easter season just flew by. Um, the color of Pentecost is red, so if you want to have some fun, put on red and come next Sunday for Pentecost when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit and thereby the birth of the church. If you have a graduate in the family, please let the church office know so that we can include your graduate in the next newsletter. Their name, school, degree, next plans, like that. Uh, as I met, have been mentioning, Fred's book, the latest, the Mano and the Honu, is here. Um, it's targeted for children age seven and under. So if you have a child, grandchild in that age range, talk with me. And if you already pre-ordered, then also uh, come either in the sacristy, you can pick one up. It's all about love, a festival of the Jesus movement. I've been mentioning that too. That's a festival of the church-wide uh, community, July 9th through 12th in Baltimore. Uh, if you are interested in going, speak with me. I am also going to be going to that conference. And Camp Mokalea, if you have children or grandchildren who could benefit from a wonderful experience up on the North Shore, uh, learning more about their faith and enjoying the beauty of that place. Speak with me because we have scholarships available for all campers. Uh, they have camps for first grade through uh, high school. And uh, coffee and cookies today in the parish hall, yes. Uh, Bible study every Sunday, uh, every Sunday, Bible study every Wednesday at 10 o'clock by Zoom. We look at the readings for the coming Sunday. And a moment with music with Dr. Epping every weekday by 6 a.m. on line on the Facebook church Facebook site or the website. And then, of course, Jazz Vespers every Thursday here in person or online. We are on hold with the UH Food Vault during the summer because they are closed, but we continue to collect travel size hygiene products for the houseless ministry at Wally House of St. Elizabeth's, our sister congregation. Um, just a word about communion. We are, the vestry uh, and Eucharistic ministers are evaluating the way that we are uh, receiving communion. Uh, after the pandemic, you know, we had several years where we weren't receiving communion at all and then not at the altar rail. And we came back going up the side so that we would have, we would avoid these stairs. And because at the 10 o'clock we have a choir that sings right here. Um, this service, we don't have the choir. So we're discussing how we might uh, improve that flow. While we're doing that conversation, I'm going to suggest for today uh, that you will still come up the side aisles, but if stairs are not an issue for you, you are welcome to come down the stairs and return by that way, and we'll see if that helps the flow a little bit uh, better. But we'll start again with this side going up the um, Mackay side, and then uh, Malka side, and then the Mackay side. Um, there is also a hand sanitizer at uh, both ends for those of you that like to use that before you come up. Um, birthdays. We have several birthdays this week, and one today, and that is Robert Savala. Happy birthday! It's time to sing! Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Robert, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday Robert, have a wonderful day of your birth. And also Ryan Ono, uh, son of Tiari and Ray Ono has a birthday on Monday. Those are the only two I'm aware of this week, unless somebody else knows of a birthday. So let us take out our Books of Common Prayer, page 830, number 50. Page 830 in the back, number 50, and we'll pray for Robert and Ryan. Let us pray. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servants, Robert and Ryan as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. And do we have anyone? Ah, 
Carolyn and Paul are traveling Monday. Yep, tomorrow. Um, anyone else that's traveling? It's so good to have you two back there. I think most of you know they come from Boston. So, yeah, Adrian's daughter, uh, Carolyn, for those of you who don't know. Anyone else traveling this week? Yes, Jen. Okay, Josh is leaving again tomorrow night. Oh, that poor man. He must have a lot of frequent flyer miles. <laughs> Anybody else traveling? All right, then let's remember Paul and Carolyn and Josh. Let's turn to page 831 in your Books of Common Prayer at the top. Page 831. Let us pray. O God, our Heavenly Father, whose glory fills the whole creation and whose presence we find wherever we go, preserve those who travel, in particular Paul and Carolyn and Josh. Surround them with your loving care. Protect them from every danger and bring them in safety to their journey's end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Safe travels and a quick journey. <laughs> now we will have the collection of our offering. We give thanks for all of you at, uh, here in person as well as at home who give in many different ways through the mail, online, through the plate. Uh, thank you for remembering the church and being part of this ministry, making it possible. As uh, you do that, let me look and see if it's a hymn. It is. Joseph is shaking his head, so i got to look and see which one. It's number 603, When Christ Was Lifted from the Earth. Number, oh, good hymn on ascension. Number 603, and you may remain seated as uh, you sing that hymn. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being. Sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. 
but we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come. We offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now we pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia! The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. You may be seated and the Malchusai can begin to come forward.
I invite you to stand or kneel for the post-communion prayer printed on page 9 of your bulletins. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Joseph has informed me that our insert is missing at the end of it, so we are going to change the closing hymn to your hymnal, number 494. Number 494, crown him with many crowns, a well-known favorite. 494. Good choice, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.